Hey folks, you're very welcome back to the Meditations on Movement podcast. Today, we are going to be discussing mobility. Um, everything that I have to offer in terms of giving you um, all the juicy details, all the important things when it comes to mobility, um, and where it's useful in a movement practice. Now, the one thing I want to start off here is to um, make sure that you're aware that this is another one of those lenses that I've been talking about in previous episodes in and in a lot of my content. Um, this idea that we have multiple different things, multiple possibilities, multiple ways of viewing the body. And mobility is something that we can certainly develop within the body. Um, and it's certainly then as a result of the feedback that we may get from looking at mobility and our understanding of it, we may start to see it as sort of a lens. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll keep that in mind as the podcast goes on, uh, showing you in some way how I was seeing it as a certain lens and how it was uh, shaping my view, not necessarily distorting my view, but shaping it in a certain way and, and how that you know progressed throughout the years to the point that I'm not now, that I'm starting to... Um, certainly build a bigger picture myself of these different lenses and different caps that I can put on at any stage to analyze an issue, to look at the body, to, to see a different and alternative viewpoint. Um, so that's hopefully what I'm going to bring you through is obviously my, my understanding of what mobility is, uh, some, some terms, um, some myths maybe, all those sort of things. Um, and hopefully it certainly answers a lot of questions that you may have about mobility and then obviously if there are questions feel free to reach out to me and i will be happy to answer them okay so uh let's get started what i'm gonna deal with first is my sort of training and expertise and to get to that i need to give you just a little bit of background detail into um kind of how i got into training and and where mobility sort of slotted in for me how it came about for me so when I was younger, I was playing a lot of field sports. I've been through in previous episodes, like my my um, sort of history and stuff like that. So I'll keep this brief. Um, I was playing a lot of field sports basically when I was very, very young and um, progressed into my teens that I started um, doing some combat sports, uh, specifically Chinese kickboxing. Um, that was sort of my main thing for a period of time. And interspersed in between that would have been sort of the gym work that I was doing. Um, I wouldn't have seen that necessarily as a sport, but it did take up certainly a predominant amount of my time. Uh, definitely when I was in secondary school in tandem with a lot of the kickboxing and stuff like that. And when I got into it, um, a lot of the focus would have been on bodybuilding style training, uh, small amounts of strength work. And I see this in some way as a, as a point in time where I developed uh, a good base of, of different things. Like I had the... Field sports helping me build, you know, more of my cardiovascular system. I then had the strength work from the gym, the bodybuilding style work that helped me build more muscle mass, more size, more strength, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then uh, the kickboxing, just developing sort of the different aspects, learning how to lose, use my legs in different ways um, and, and really shaping a, a bigger picture for me. But I think one thing that I was doing at the time was I was seeing certain aspects certain qualities certain things that my body could do as maybe more important um, and i think it shaped me in some way in terms of my understanding of the body by seeing strength as such an important thing i think there was such a positive response it was the response that i sort of received at the time it was very interesting to feel that sort of strength in my body the um the 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 change that i was seeing really it it motivated me and spurred me on in a certain way and i think uh, for some, it could be an interesting thing. It could be something different for, for the person depending, but I think we all can sort of um, get an understanding of that that physical change that happens, whether it be the strength, the cardiovascular system, um, your your flexibility, all those different things. When you see that change, uh, when you feel it, when you experience it, it's very um, it's very confirming. You're, you're, you're so engrossed in it, and you see whatever the thing is that you've developed as being so important. Um, and that sort of shaped me as time went on. You know, I was I was still doing a lot of the kickboxing. Um, I then eventually uh, played around with other martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But the gym work always seemed to be the kind of more important thing for me and certainly led me to my career. I started off as a sort of fitness instructor and personal trainer um, to, to the point now where I'm sort of more of an online coach, a teacher, a resource. Um, and I can see that sort of progression of my career as time has gone on. And 
in that development, you start to see these, as I said, these different things as having more weight. Um, I still see strength as really important to develop, but I now have that perspective of seeing the bigger picture over time as to what's important. And when I was that age, I got such a response from it. Strength was one of the number one things for me, strength and size, really. And so that led to a, a, a certainly a physical change in the body. It meant, uh, to me, it meant very strict, very rigid um protocols and means to which I was trying to achieve my goals and my goals were solely based on getting stronger in a lot of my key lifts moving in very specific patterns that I could load them heavily so that I could get that response that I was looking for in terms of building the strength in the tissue um, and building the size of the tissue so you can kind of see then that was my that was my focus those were the goggles that I was wearing when I was looking at the human body and you have this it is a distorted view in some way it's it's useful for the for the goal it's useful for the means but you can see then how alternate perspectives almost um become irrelevant it's like if it doesn't if it doesn't help me build strength if it doesn't help me build size I wasn't really concerned about it that was until um so like it, it's a case of certainly understanding that I, I was aware of those other things but I just wasn't being pulled towards them maybe is a better way to think of it so what that meant was um the building of size and strength for me at that time anyway uh, started to narrow my body's possibilities really you know you're moving within very specific ranges the uh, ability for the body to move outside those ways then becomes harder and harder because your body is adapting to very specific patterns, very specific movements, um, and it's not really getting a broad range of variability. So that led to a handful of issues for me. Uh, injured my shoulder, injured my knee in jiu-jitsu, and I then found myself going, okay, well, strength obviously was was working. It's not like it wasn't working, but it led to an injury. And um, the the way I see the the jujitsu injury in particular was uh, the injury was given to me almost in a sense that uh, it was it was specifically someone driving against me. So it's kind of hard to argue that it's like oh it's it was an overuse injury, whereas that was the result of my shoulder issue. My shoulder issue was kind of more of an overuse thing. So that that was where I almost took responsibility in terms of the training that I was doing was was responsible for my shoulder, whereas the knee. Obviously, I took responsibility in the in the end, but at the time, I was like, "Oh, like there was nothing I could have done about it." So, I went about in in a typical way of trying to solve these issues, just looking at it through that lens of sort of bodybuilding and strength. And unfortunately, that didn't uh, work. As many of us have probably seen, you have that narrow mindset. You need to branch out. You need to get a, an alternate viewpoint and understanding from someone else. So that led me to. Um, seeing things through more of a lens of mobility. And I think what happened in the same way was my response to mobility work was great. It it certainly relieved a lot of pain. It gave me back a lot of function. It opened up a lot of range. And suddenly I found myself like, wow, I was so restricted. You know, as a result of all the bodybuilding and strength style work, it's like I've now been given back all of this different range. My body was responding so positively to it that you then take take that you point again and you go wow this is the best thing ever everyone needs it and so that sort of threw my thinking in a certain direction for for a long period of time and i think that's what brought me to the point of um sort of realization over time getting a better understanding that like all of these things are relevant you may have just not got the pull towards this one specific area but there certainly needs to be ample time spent on these specific things, a certain time developing strength, a certain time developing hypertrophy, a certain time developing mobility, whatever whatever uh, th thing it is that you feel you need to develop or is possible to, uh, to develop. Um, that leads me then on to, I suppose, giving a little bit more of a clear definition of what I think mobility is. So um, you see this argument online all the time, this difference between what is mobility and what is flexibility. To me, the idea would be is flexibility is that idea for a tissue to respond at, at length and um, it doesn't necessarily need to be active you know that i built the idea of say putting a stretch on an elastic band you have some tissue that will sort of put itself into that position and it will respond um in a 
you know, you won't get that nervous system response of, of, of feeling as if you want to come out of something straight away. You can see, think of the idea of, say, uh, resting on your shins. That, to me, is flexibility where you can sit back on your ankles. I know for some people that's very easy, but for others when they don't have the range of motion and the flexibility in the ankles, uh, that is very hard to achieve. The reason why I kind of point that out is you can understand by just sort of sitting there passively, that to me is flexibility. Holding a hamstring stretch is 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 flexibility. It's the idea is to just get into a certain position, hold, relax, whatever. Mobility then is a lot more active. So to me, mobility is that idea of actually being able to move into the range. Okay. And that's sort of the the way in which I've termed them and got an understanding that, you know, both are necessary to a certain degree. To me, flexibility is part of the mobility process, whereas mobility doesn't necessarily come as part of the flexibility process. Um, and certain time dedicated, as I said, to, to one can distort our views or can lead us down a certain way in terms of how our body will develop over time. Okay, so so this is where I want you to put your sort of thinking now is this idea of um, passive and active modal modalities, this idea of mobility versus flexibility. It's the way in which I've sort of thought of it over time. Um, the way in which I think this comes to, to us is uh, the idea of uh, us separating different tissues, okay? We, um, we often say that we're like stretching a muscle, okay? Uh, we, we think that, you know, I need to get a, this muscle is tight, I need to stretch it out. Um, all of these different things, these sort of things that make sense in our brain, these sort of logical inferences uh, for us, they, they shape the, the language that we use, they shape the way in which we approach things. Um, and the, this term that I'm about to use is something for, from a system called functional range systems. It's, it's a, a certificate degree. It's something that I have, have studied, a, a seminar that I've done, um, and a whole system of, of learning that I have engrossed myself in for a period of time. Um, I'll kind of get to an, a part later, uh, kind of explaining in some way what it, exactly it is and, and, and some of the things about it. Uh, but one of the, the concepts that they use is this term called bioflow. So bioflow is this idea that uh, we're not necessarily as separate as we may think we are. Uh, the separateness in some way comes from the way in which we define things. We have this great ability to open up a human being, have a cadaver out in front of us, and start to identify the different tissues. And it's relevant to some degree, but it also shapes our thinking is another way to think of it. Um, so when we separate the tissue, we almost see them as completely different things. Uh, we forget that they are one attached to the other or that they are one thing on its own. Um, we look at the muscle tissue and we go, okay, the stretch is only happening on the muscle tissue, but that is not the best way to think about it. We need to think of what are the... What's the line of tension that we maybe have is a better way to think of it rather than the specific part of the muscle that we're stretching because that stretch is happening from the origin to insertion of that line of tissue. So that stretch can be felt all the way into what would be considered the almost straight to the bone is is, is really an easy way to think of it. You've got um, the the muscle fibers themselves. We think about as that like the belly of, of, of a muscle. If you think of say like the bicep in your arm, would easily be able to identify the muscle. It's, it's that big sort of organ. But then as the tissue gets closer to the origin or insertion point, you'll usually classify that as tendon. And as I said, that classification leads us to believe then that, okay, the muscle becomes a tendon. But if we zoom in and look at it at a very microscopic level, you're going to see a blending and a molding and a shaping into new tissue. So it's very hard to really sit uh, down with a microscope and say, okay, this is exactly that point where the muscle becomes the tendon um, and they're, they're clearly defined from there the same way they would in you know, like an anatomy book, a drawing, an illustration. So that leads our thinking into saying, okay, with that stretch, that the flexibility work, the, the hypertrophy work, whatever the work that we do only really happens on that muscular, uh, that muscle part of the musculoskeletal system. But it's really uh, uh, the wrong way to think of it in the sense that that um, way in which we're, we sort of function is really the line of tension all the way from the muscle into the tendon, uh, into the ligament, right into the, to the joint capsule and into the bone and all of those different tissues molding from one into the other. Um, and it gives us a better understanding of then, okay, well, 
what are we looking for in terms of mobility and, and how do we then start to define these different parts, these different ways of looking at the body. Um, and it, it leads us on to this, uh, to this uh, state of kind of looking at it as like the interplay between what is not only the musculoskeletal system, but our nervous system. So the, everything that I was just defining there in some way was the um, inner part of the body. The idea that we are just a, a sack of, of muscles and bones, we'd be nothing without our nervous system actually controlling things. Okay, so our nervous system is what is sending those signals back and forth to the tissue to actually move and go about and complete a, a certain movement. Okay, and um, the, the basic concept is that my muscle is just sitting there waiting for a stimulus, waiting for something to, to tell it to move in some way. Okay, it's waiting for that electrical stimulus. So we've got that tissue there, um, and, and then we, we've looked at it from this idea of, of mobility and flexibility. The passive nature of what we do sometimes uh, when we do flexibility work is we're really in some way working on... It's hard to say that we're working exactly on the, the structures alone. Like, it's, 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 it's a spectrum. You would argue to some degree that flexibility work really works towards the tissue end of things, Okay. Um, as I said, don't think for a moment that mobility work is not working on the tissue, but if you were to really sort of look at it and say, okay, flexibility is most likely the way to determine it would be you're, you're working on the tissue side of things. You're just looking to get that sort of elongation through the tissue, through the, uh, the muscle, the tendons, the ligaments, those sort of things. Okay. So then you, you'll, you'll sort of see the integration of the nervous system in the mobility side of things, in the active side of things. And what do I mean by the active side of things? What I mean is you can think about it, say, for example, with, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm in front of a video right now, so the only thing I can think of to give an example of is, say, like shoulder flexibility. So if you imagine my hand up overhead for an overhead press or a, a handstand or whatever it is, if I get into the position and I start to raise up my arm and go through flexion and I get to a point where I kind of can't go any further, you can imagine I could set some sort of way of, of setting up and getting a stretch. Um, I could hinge over into an all fours position. I could grab onto something and I could get a stretch on all the tissue on the underside um, and, and feel that stretch sensation. When I say is it, a simple way of even thinking of it here, just this idea of flexing um, and extending, going back and forth. That is an active way of moving. That is mobility. Um, and if we are very limited in our range of motion, anytime we get near an end range position, that's pretty much where we would sort of deem the mobility work is happening. It's near our end ranges. So active, uh, the passive way in which we might achieve that stretch position, as I said, I just hold on to something and I try to relax as much as possible. I could say hang from a bar. But active would be the idea of moving towards those end range positions and um, performing something really near the end range. And both are useful is what I want you to take from this. Um, and and they, can, they can both be used to sort of help us develop um, more of an ability to open up, to, uh, to have both flexibility and mobility in certain joints, in certain areas, certain movements. Okay. I've certainly given you a lot of already to sort of contemplate, so I do want to make sure that I have all of those sort of laid out in full for us. That's why I keep I want to keep sort of going back to this idea of active and passive. And so I've given us that idea of, of mobility, flexibility. I've given us that idea of passive, active. I've given us that idea of bioflow, this, this sort of um, line of tension rather than thinking that it's just muscles that we're working on. We're really working on so much in the body uh, when we're doing certain activities, not just mobility work. We're really, you know, when we're doing hypertrophy work, when we're doing strength work, and um, when we're doing static work, when we're doing uh, sprints, all these different things where there's so much involved. It's very hard to just say, okay, one specific thing is really being targeted. But unfortunately, the, the kind of way in which we use it in terms of languages, that's what it leads us to do. So um, that's where I want to give you this idea of the the spectrum by which we're thinking about things. Um, something might be heavily weighted towards one end of the spectrum, but it doesn't mean that other parts of the system aren't involved at all, okay? So um, now giving us this idea of the nervous system, this is what we were certainly, we were just talking about there. Um, we we want to get this idea of where the 
nervous system is involved in the mobility process. So what I mean by that is um, we have, sorry, my laptop's just gone. Give me one quick second. I just want to make sure I have the notes out in front of me. Whoop. That's what I had. I can edit this out. Or will I is the question. Okay, now I have it back in front of us. So, um, this idea of the, the nervous system's role in mobility, yes. So, we're just giving all that idea of the 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 tissue and what, it, what it's doing. So, where does the nervous system come in in all this? It's the decision maker, okay? It's uh, all of those different things, okay? So, you might get this idea in, um, or the, the best way to sort of understand this is, um, and the way I like to think of it, um, in terms of mobility is the nervous system has this uh, role of protection, okay? Or in some way, it needs to feel confident, okay? So when you're moving into a certain range, your nervous system needs to feel confident near that end range, okay? And um, what that will mean then is that if you get to a certain position, and your nervous system isn't confident, hasn't built up enough experience, doesn't feel like it's safe in that specific area, it's going to do something. It's going to limit you. It's going to stop you, okay? It has this idea of efferent and afferent feedback. Afferent feedback is feedback to the brain where it's sending uh, signals, efferent feedback. It's sending signals from brain to body, but it's also receiving signals, receiving things from receptor cells, where it's getting an idea of, okay, how is the movement going is one way to think of it. So you are moving your arm into flexion up overhead. And as you're moving, you're sending that signal to move into the position. And then you're getting signals and um, all sorts of uh, sort of reflexes and stuff like that. Um, and, and cells that are specifically sending this information back to the brain. And it's taking that information and it's saying, okay, if things are going well, follow through. Keep going. Whatever the movement itself was planned, we're happy out. If it gets to that point where it understands, okay, we're going towards a position where we are are almost near our, our, our end, then it's going to stop you. It's going to limit you. It's this idea that if you were to go any further, you would hurt yourself. And that, in, in some way, is what the nervous system is definitely not trying to do. It wants you to survive. So it doesn't want you hurting yourself. So that's where you find yourself being limited in some way in terms of your range of motion. It's this it, this uh, way of thinking of it that if you can't get into a certain position, then your nervous system is stopping you for a very specific reason. Okay, and it stops us by uh, increasing tension in a certain way. It stops us by uh, sending pain signals is, is another way to think of it, another way in which it, it sort of responds. And... Um, uh, another way is an imbalance in some way where you have one side that's maybe a little bit more limited than the other and it's it's sort of sending it has these ways of sort of adjusting and changing the system to fit its needs its needs being survival really um, I don't want you to think of that as the only way in which the nervous system is is sort of uh, serving us it's not uh, it's 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 one of the primary things but really the way I'd like to think of it is confidence. Confidence and, um, you know, money in the bank. Have you spent a lot of time in a very flexed position? Have you opened up the range? Have you given, given yourself enough uh, credit to be able to go and do those things? Because if you then suddenly start to go and do something with a joint that it's never done before, that's where you're probably going to reach issues, okay? So that's one way that we want to think of the nervous system and it, its role in the mobility process is... Um, whether or not it feels that it can give you access to the to the certain range, um, it's it's a simple uh, equation of basically saying that okay, if we have enough strength in the tissue, then it's all good to go. But if we don't have enough strength in the tissue, those tissues being say like elongated, like as I said, going up overhead, my my lats are getting elongated. So if if my nervous system doesn't feel confident in my lats' ability to produce force to, to be okay near that end range or my, the joint structures, the joint capsule, all those different things. If it's just receiving signals that, that are leading it to believe that we're going to hurt ourselves or that we can't complete the task in a very efficient way or whatever it may be, um, 
it's going to limit us okay so that's a really important part of the process of mobility to understand because when it comes back to that idea of passive and active modalities we can start to see how the passive modalities only really deal with that tissue part of the equation or as i said they're seriously weighted towards that tissue part of the equation and if we don't build the active part this idea of building say the isometric strength this idea of building that ability to elongate the tissue eccentrically remember like we're involved within an eccentric contraction like the tissue is elongating under our control and then we're actively contracting out of that okay so that's a, a really specific part of the process is developing the the active part also and also the passive part the passive part in some way the way i like to think of it is the passive gives us access it gives us that ability to actually get into a position hold it for a long period of time opens up a little bit of range and then we can maybe do something actively okay and um, that's a that's a really important thing to understand in in the mobility process or in the process of just doing anything where we feel like our range is lacking okay um so I feel I've given a lot there, um, and, I, and I did certainly spend a lot of time on that nervous system idea because it is such an important and integral part of the process, um, to me anyway. Um, one thing I feel is necessary as we sort of delve into here then is to sort of get, get once again, this idea of sort of defining uh, different ways of sort of viewing things. So there's one way of looking at mobility in terms of maybe uh, terming things as joint-focused mobility and movement focused mobility and the way i term this is it goes back to my understanding in terms of a system of categorization or a system of movement the frc system that i was talking about earlier functional range systems or functional range conditioning and um, this is very joint focused okay they focus heavily on this idea of looking at the body as a system of joints not only but it's certainly a big heavy part of their system um so in that process, they really want you to focus on this idea of building the mobility in the joints. And it goes back to this idea of bioflow, this idea of the nervous system being confident near your end range of motion. And if the joint specifically doesn't feel confident, or if your nervous system doesn't feel confident in the joint's ability to handle load near the end range of motion, then it won't allow that access. Okay, it won't allow you to go into those certain positions. Um, it's not the only way of viewing things, and I think that's where the system maybe has its issues. Um, to me, anyway, in terms of how it was communicated to me and, and all my sort of learning and, and what I took from it, once again, this is my interpretation of it to some degree. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly aware that the system doesn't uh, exist solely in my brain. It, 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 it's, it, it exists in the practitioners, the people that have come up with it and the way in which they've kind of communicated and their understanding. But my understanding of the system basically is that it is very, very focused on the joint side of things and doesn't really go into the movement side of things. And this is something that I almost want to define as, as, t as two separate parts is it's important to, uh, certainly to, to, to understand that the joints need to be mobile. But I think spending the time that they want you to spend on the joint side of things doesn't allow for the the overall development of the system in a very positive way it, it leads us to this idea of only ever working on the joints and their mobility and not expanding past that into other things and um, but then again it's that idea of we could really park on about this for years and years and years and we develop the body in a certain way if a yogi develops their body only doing yoga that's really going to be the things that they get and they've probably just put too much weight too much eggs in one basket the same way with someone who's developed um uh, muscle mass to, to their ends with we're trying to be a bodybuilder they've really just pushed everything towards one side and they haven't really considered the entire system and all its possibilities and what it could do and that leads to issues so that's what we're trying to establish here with this idea of um only only operating on this joint focused mobility side of things okay um which then sort of gives us this perspective of movement focused mobility and this is where we would maybe look at it as like the, the, the clear examples that i think of is uh joint focused mobility might be looking at say internal and external rotation of the shoulder the hip you're breaking things down into what the joint is capable of doing and expanding those specific range of motion so you're isolating the one joint 
um, and, and just working on that. The movement focused mobility might be looking at it and saying, okay, what are the, the various positions that I get into or the movements that I'm completing that I need to open up? And one might be, say, like the Kazakh squat. You might be looking at, say, lateral movements of the hip. Mobility in terms of the Kazakh squat. Okay, and, and this is where I think then it becomes the the applicability of the concepts over the methods. Um, and this is a term that I've sort of, uh, not stolen, but borrowed maybe is a better way to think of it, from Dr. Andy Galtman. He, has, he uh, uses this term of... Uh, the methods are many, but the concepts are few. And this is what I want to give you in terms of this this idea of mobility going forward is applying the various um, concepts to what you're doing rather than just the methods. You know, not saying what's the exact stretch or the exact position, the exact thing that I need to do for X, Y, and Z issue. It's saying what are the what are the concepts that I can apply to my training in a sort of an overall manner. Um, and and integrate those things in, those principles that are really, really important uh, that lead to the adaptation. So not just the, the methods themselves, but the concepts behind the methods. So um, where this comes in then with the mo movement focus is, um, I think, you know, time needs to be spent on, on both, certainly. Um, you need to maybe look at things with a certain lens or say, and say, okay, where is it relevant to me that maybe my joint needs a little bit more focus? Um, to me, this is in my training. This has been where I have identified, and in, in, in a, at, a, at a certain phase of my training, where I'm so conscious of one specific area of my body, looking at it and going, "Do you know what? I've been doing so many things recently for the uh, where I, where I put my shoulders in certain positions, and I've been so aware of the limitations around just the shoulder, not only in the movements that I'm doing, but it's like that. That seems to be." excuse me, the common denominator in all those movements where I'm lacking range of motion. And that's where I might get a little bit more analytical and start to say, okay, what specific things in terms of the shoulder? Is it uh, internal, external rotation? Is it flexion extension? Um, and, and can I identify just underlying limitations in, in the joint itself? I can go through some assessments. And these are obviously expertise that I have myself in terms of what I'm able to do. Um, I'm aware of those things, how to assess them and how to go about them and how to, how to, correctly in some way or or uh, identify uh with a, with a great degree of certainty that okay this this is potentially one of the issues um then it's it's certainly valuable to look at things from maybe a movement focused mobility perspective at certain stages in your training or or when it's relevant and necessary and this just might be you know when you haven't found that there's necessarily like as i said there i gave the example of a certain period of my training recognizing the, the limitations in say one specific joint this is where we might look at it and just say, okay, I know that I'm, I'm exposing myself to certain positions and I'm very, very limited in terms of getting into those positions. So how do I go about building my mobility for that position, that movement, that thing that I'm doing? So not just necessarily, you're almost, you're shifting the perspective. You're not saying just the body itself, but the position that I'm trying to get in with the body. All right. And this obviously leads to uh, developing the, the mobility required. Um, and looking at that movement, that position, not necessarily just the joint necessary. So I wouldn't necessarily say that the minute you identify a movement or a position that's that's very, very difficult for you to get in, you then assess the joint and find out what's wrong with it. It's like, it's, a, it's one way of doing it, but you're probably going to wait and want to wait more of your time towards the specific positions. So when I said that example of, say, the Kazakh, I would try to get myself in more Kazakh-like positions. Um, I could play around with uh, a middle splits position where I have much more elongation on the uh, tissues on the inside of the leg and looking to contract more of the tissue on the outside, very similar to what is the Cossack squat. And then very simply, like do more Cossack squats, a very simple way to think of it, obviously, as well. Uh, not just getting vastly overcomplicated with it, but just doing the things that I'm trying to do um, knowing in some way that I'm obviously able to do it, having the confidence and, and understanding and awareness of my body that I am able to do it and that I'm not putting myself at risk. You know, obviously, if you've gone through the assessment and you've got awareness to recognize uh, when something might be an issue, like you just don't have the strength there, the stability required, whatever it is, then don't go and do that. You need to kind of build up those things before you go and get yourself into those uh, positions that you're just not ready for yet. Um, and this leads us on to a concept uh, 
to discuss called reciprocal inhibition. And this is part of the mobility process as well. It's it kind of, I, I wanted to wait till now to do it because I wanted to get that idea of the joint focused versus the moving focused mobility. And um, to go back to a few points previously, obviously we went through that idea of, okay, mobility, flexibility, passive active modalities, um, the, the bio flow, the, 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 our tendency to kind of separate the tissues uh, when really we want to think of them as sort of one, one thing in some way. We want to, get, we want to have that uh, lens in our mind. Uh, this idea of the nervous system's role in the mobility process. And then last, we just discussed there, this idea of joint focus mobility and movement focus mobility. So what do we mean by reciprocal inhibition? Um, I'm probably going to end the podcast here and maybe release this, release this as a second part just because I've recognized the time. Okay, um, so I, I've literally got through half of the points and I can see that some of the things that I want to discuss here uh, in terms of mobility and understandably mobility is a, not a complex, but it's a, it's, it's, it's enough, it's important to give it to its due time. You know, I don't want to rush through these last few um, and give sort of a poor uh, definition and understanding because we've already gone through so much there in terms of what uh, mobility is and, and the key things about it. So something I'm happy to discuss on a, another episode and go into a lot more detail, but you have hopefully got a lot from that already. Um, and the thing that I'm trying to, tr trying to um, give in some way with these podcasts because of the method of communication here um, is concepts okay concepts lenses ways of viewing caps that you can put on okay and, and maybe i'll bring it to a close obviously the next podcast that we do on mobility uh where i can where i can uh give some more specifics and maybe practical advice or, or things like that but really seeing these things as part of a bigger whole okay and um, i think the problem for me for a period of time was getting caught up in in these sort of perspectives and saying okay this is so important it's back to what i was saying about when i was younger and i was seeing strength as so so important i still see it as important but i'm recognizing its part in the overall picture it's not the only thing that i can develop or should develop uh, for a well-functioning well-rounded um system body whatever way I want to think of it, okay? I think it's just one thing that we uh, we see a lot of the times now is um, no room for competing ideas in some way or competing things that we want to help build at the same time, maybe is one way to think of it. Um, so on that note, and with that in mind, until the next episode, and hopefully if you have joined us, if this is maybe your first episode, you're going to be able to go back to a handful of my other episodes and you're going to be able to see that sort of thing being communicated to you across these podcasts is this idea of the lenses in which we can start to view things and we can start to see from this perspective, okay, what's happening with the system, what's going on, and then take the lens off, take the cap off and go, okay, I was viewing things through that lens. Now what's sort of standing out to me as a result of just using that lens to help me maybe identify something, to play around with something, and then how am I able to take back and sort of see it now as part of the whole bigger picture? Okay. Um, questions. If you have any, be sure to let me know. And hopefully if there are any big looming questions, I'm going to get to them in the next episode on mobility. Uh, however long that is and however long it takes for me to do that episode. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for listening. Uh, one thing I want to comment on before I, I go off is... Um, I'm trying to gauge interest in the movement school idea uh, that I have uh, for the future. This is a way of me looking at my work that I'm doing with people uh, going into the years to come, really. Um, it's, it's seeing this change in my role for, as more of a teacher rather than a coach. I still take on students privately where I do offer programming and very specific work for them to do. Um, but this idea of opening up the online movement school is to give these uh, ideas for to you, these these things that I'm communicating with the podcast in a more definite, concrete way. I'm giving you these things to focus on so that you start to develop a, a, a better practice, a better understanding. I know people are sort of hungry for that information 
um, through viewing various sort of things online or, or, or seeing various things in action and saying, okay, what exactly is it that, that this person is keeping in mind when they're doing such and such? Um, so that's what I want to give to the Movement School. And certainly there will be a programming element to it. It's just going to be a very general one. Um, I say general, uh, but it's obviously going to be very, there's going to be lots of nuance to it. It's, it's going to be a very interesting thing looking at a movement practice as our, as our thing to develop. Um, and, and our thing that we're going to focus on uh, going forward. So the way in, I which, uh, in which I talk about my students is there's just way more, from my private students is there's just way more specific feedback, whereas this is just we're all collective in that group. Um, and that's going to be a, a very interesting environment to uh, to be in, uh, feeding off other people um, in, in a way online as well that I'm excited to, to, to see for myself, all right? So uh, I'm just trying to gauge interest at first. I'm 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 gonna base the interest off of uh, off of how much interest I get, and I'm gonna kind of play around with what will be the launch date. Um, so if you are interested, I'm gonna leave a uh, website link underneath this that you can subscribe to the waiting list for it. And by subscribing on the waiting list, you're just letting me know if you are um, interested in the idea of taking part in the movement school, the online movement school. Um, and then I can just give a better idea of, okay, if I if I see a certain amount of numbers, I can give a better idea in terms of a launch date going forward, okay? Uh, so I'd really appreciate it if you're listening to these podcasts, you're intrigued by a lot of these concepts, you've seen some of my content, and you just want to get a better idea of what that is and what it's going to entail, then I'd certainly encourage you to go back to the last episode. I think it's episode 10 or 11. Um, I can even link to it in this. Um, but you're basically going to see it's, it's, it's giving the details of the online movement school in a greater amount of detail, okay? I'm waffling on. So I'm going to leave you. Uh, I will talk to you soon on the next episode. But for now, see you soon.